everyone, welcome back to the channel. Um, today we have a story artist from Switzerland uh, where she's currently living. She graduated in media engineering with a thesis in storyboarding for animation. Uh, since then, she worked uh, not just in feature, but also TV and advertising, including for a feature film at Cineside Montreal, where we met. And she's now a story artist for an announced uh, feature film at Netflix Animation. Welcome to my guest of the day, Sarah Vittori. Hello. Hi, hey, everyone. <laughs> How's it going? Good, thank you. How are you? I, I asked you this before, before recording this chat, but, you know, if we don't say it, <laughs> While recording, it doesn't exist. That's true. So um, I'm doing fine. It's Friday. So yay, <laughs> weekend's coming. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Uh, looking forward to go back to the studio eventually, working. But yeah. But we'll have time to talk about how do you feel about working from home since it's what you do most of the time now. Like, well, since the beginning, right? Since always, yeah. Since, since always. Like years, yeah. Uh, to, to anyone uh, watching the video, uh, please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you like this type of content because it helps with YouTube and uh, so that YouTube shows it to more people. Uh, but let's just start. Um, so when someone asked in one of the previous videos, someone comment asking if everybody who works in big studios comes from the main North American school like uh, CalArts, Sheridan, Wrigling. Um, I knew it wasn't true because I met a lot of people that are not from one of those schools, uh, but you came to mind because um, I find that your path toward Netflix is uh, proof of uh, perseverance and hard work. And oh, I think you. it's a good story to tell because, you know, like you're from Europe like me, but you never crossed the ocean and yet you still you're already working in Netflix. Um, but so how did everything start? Like, what was your educational path? Uh, I said you got a media engineering uh, bachelor degree. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that lead to storyboarding? Um, well, uh, so I have this media engineering degree, but before that I was already working. So I was working in business administration because we have a different school system. So I didn't go to university first, but did an apprenticeship. So I'm coming from that background and media engineering, like we were uh, taught there about more like corporate communications, also about film, but more in the sense of advertisement. Um, and we had some drawing classes, more like to sketch like basic anatomy perspective. But that was kind of enough for me to spark an interest in storyboarding. And like you mentioned in the introduction, I wrote my bachelor thesis about storyboarding for feature animation. Because it was just like we had the freedom to choose like a topic that we are interested in. And even though like my degree isn't about storyboarding at all or like slightly about animation, but more like multimedia in general. But I thought maybe like give it a try. And because of that thesis, I, I had the opportunity to talk to multiple artists from Pixar, Disney, DreamWorks and so on. And like writing the thesis, I got really interested. And then... After so, so you you interviewed them? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just wrote wow. emails to them. Like I made up the email addresses. And like, okay, that's a guy I saw like in the credits from I don't know Shrek. And I was like, okay, that's the head of story. Let's write to him. And so many people replied. It was really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're so nice. And yeah, it just got me hooked. And then after graduating, I did an internship at the small animation studio here in Switzerland, where I was kind of like an illustrator. Um, I made like all the um, graphics for their motion design videos. So I was like working and learning at the same time. And then I think it was because there was a, an apprenticeship opening up at Disney feature animation. And I was like, oh, that would be so cool. And I put a portfolio together, which was very, very crappy looking back. But that was kind of the start because I realized I really want to do this. I like work-wise, um, the internship ended and like it all came together. So I thought I take a couple of months off and give this storyboarding thing a try. Like I did a lot of self-studying at home for a couple of months. It wasn't always fun, but it paid out in the end. Like like that, I came into the storyboarding field, found my first job at Brownback Films. 
um, did you find did you had like a, a mentor, someone that guided you during or gave you feedback during this time, or or was just all by yourself? Um, yes and no, kind of. So I was doing it by myself. So I had like books about cinematography and like the uh, typical drawing books that every animation school has. But I told you like I was in touch with those people from Pixar and so on due to my bachelor thesis and I just tried to keep in touch. And some of them were very nice and gave me feedback like when I put together my first crappy portfolio and they were like, okay, you have to, you need to get better. <laughs> they were, some of them were very kind, others were very direct, which was great because I knew like, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. And then after like maybe half a year or not like five months, I think I took off um, to study. I put together another portfolio and send it to them and they gave me feedback again. So they're very, very kind. So kind of uh, this mentoring, but not like uh, someone I checked in regularly. But like, uh, kind of like uh, off topic question. I find that since I started working, it's really hard to get clear feedback sometime. Like in some studios uh, that I work for, um, I feel like they will not tell you if you do like a shitty job, like oh, if really? you, unless, unless you, they're really bad and that in that case you probably <laughs> get fired. But I feel like I never get that very clear feedback about like, you know, like this is something like, okay, thank you for your work. Of course, mm -hmm. like this is for our production, but for the future, can you try to improve this or that? Cause I feel mm -hmm. like when you start working, you're just part of the production and so like, they don't feel like they need to give you that kind of feedback because you're just an employee sometimes. Mm -hmm. You feel that since you work, you start working, you got a feedback that helped you improve or not? Or yes. you find like that change? Um, so that was before I was working yeah. as a storyboard artist. So they weren't like my bosses or stuff like that. They were more people I knew that were kind enough to give me a feedback. and. The feedback was more like overall, I was still starting out and my stuff was very bad. So they were more like study more cinematography, look more for like uh, the line of action or just a drawing, keep pushing that part. They weren't like panel so-and-so should be this way, not that detail, detailed. And then like I keep kept doing that within like the last two, three years when I started out, I always like tried to make new storyboards and maybe once or twice a year, I sent it to them and they're so generous. They still answer me, which I really appreciate. And sometimes they're more specific, like in this board, maybe, I don't know that the direction is off or screen direction, whatever. So I worked on that, but I, I don't know. They were, yeah. And feedbacks from like what you mentioned from where I was an employee, I never did that. So I never asked someone, like I was paid from them, so I, Oh yeah, no. You like want to show my private work and like. <laughs> no, I never, I never asked for it, um, but um, I feel sometimes it will be helpful if, if your director or client is not happy. I wish they would tell me, you know, like I'm not completely satisfied because this is what I expect and this is not what you deliver. And I guess that's something you have to learn as a story artist, maybe to be able to communicate with them to get that kind of information without, but, um, so I guess like the lesson is that you started working, but in order to keep improving, you were, you went out of your way to produce more work and ask for feedback to people you knew, even yeah. if you were already working. So I guess that's yeah, something yeah, yeah. Uh, for people who want to do this job. Um, anyway, like going back to the story, uh, so you end up at Brown Bag, right? Yes, as a and revisionist. As a revisionist. Um, and uh, but I know like you you work in advertisement too. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So how yeah. how that um, how that came about and how do you feel that was different from your work for maybe animation studios? Mm -hmm. So I work here in advertisement because there's no like uh, there are no animation studios that work in only TV animation or feature animation. They're not produced in Switzerland. So there was just no job. So the only thing that you can do to work in animation is to work in advertisement. And um, like the, the studio I did my internship at, uh, they kept like 
kept me like a freelancer. So if they had wishes to be done or even like uh, small storyboards, they asked me, which I'm very grateful about. Um, and then the job in Ireland was like, I was very, very fortunate because I once did a story workshop in Rome and met some animation folks for the first time. And one of them was working for Brownback Films and he was an um, episodic director at the show I worked on for preschool TV. And like I said, in the time bef in the months before I was working on my portfolio, like learning, self-studying at home, and I always published everything that I did. I don't know if it's smart, but it helped in my case because we were friends on Facebook and he saw my stuff. And then it was so funny, it lined up perfectly to, uh, from the time. I think I finished my portfolio in January, January, like two years ago, I think. And at the same time, he wrote to me like, hey, we're looking for a revisionist. Do you have time? And I did a test for them. And then, yeah, I was freelancing for them as well. That's so I was very, very, very lucky because I didn't have to apply for a job. I think it's also interesting because I, I didn't thought like revisionists could be freelancers. Like I, I know that usually like in the studios here in Toronto, like for example, all the revisionists are in-house. Some of the story artists can be freelancers, but story revisionists oh. usually are in-house. Ah, oh, most of us were were um, remote, I think. Oh. I guess maybe yeah, but... Ireland works differently. Yeah, no, but, yeah, it seems like. <laughs> well, like the, I feel like the mindset in Toronto is that you know the story artists do like the broad work, but then the revisionist is the person that gets all the notes from the story supervisor and have to like nail down those parts. So like they prefer to have them in house because they have more control of getting mm -hmm. them stuff like exactly as they want it. Yeah, I feel I feel that's the mindset. I don't. I think it's a good mindset. Also, like I find that the other idea is that revisionist in house, it's a better experience for the revisionist who can grow into a story artist eventually because they, they are in this environment. Maybe I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the reason was. Maybe there were not enough story artists slash revisionists in Dublin, or just I I don't know. Maybe it's also cheaper to have like because I wasn't working full time for them. So they just like every week, sometimes I work two days, sometimes I worked five days a week for them. And it's, I guess it's easier to work with freelancers than hire people and not having work for them to do. Yeah, I that's guess. definitely true. Yeah. Um, but um, so I never work in advertisement, like how, what's the difference? Is there a difference between storyboarding for like animation, like for feature or TV and working for a client? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's a, uh, How's it? What's like the process for storyboarding and advertisement? So I guess the pros, process is maybe mainly the same. Like you get the script or a pitch from uh, your client, or sometimes I work like with a studio and they work with the other client or another agency, ad advertisement agency. It depends. Normally, I'm not directly with the client when I'm boarding. Um, yeah, so it depends if it's like a live action advertisement, because then you do more like illustrative drawings um, that are more maybe about the mood and more like set pieces. So you have the actors there that act out the scene, so you don't need to do all the character work. And for motion, motion design uh, commercials, there may be similar too. But I guess you do like compared to feature animation, you do less acting. Um, it needs less, uh, yeah, less panels, I guess. It, it really depends on the director. Some like it loose, some like it more like paintings. Do you yeah. like, uh, do you like uh, this experience in a, a feature animation better than like the work for advertisement or? Yeah, definitely. No, I want to work in feature animation. The problem is just, I'm in Switzerland and there is no feature animation. So <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I would have started directly or would have tried to get hired at a feature animation studio. I mean, I, I don't want to talk bad about advertisement, but oh, it's no, like, like, like it's a preference. It's not, there's people who likes working, for example, like it's the same, I feel like it's the same thing with TV. Like a lot of people thinks that the ultimate goal is to get into feature film. But I find that there's people who actually enjoy TV more because they like the fact that, you know, I don't know, like in TV, you work on an episode for like four weeks and then it's a new episode and you yeah. never look back. And some mm -hmm. people likes that fact that you keep changing, you keep going on while like maybe in feature film, you, I feel like personally, I find you have more room to grow because you, you, 
you go over and over the same story and you change it, you improve it and you do your own revisions. So like you have more room to, to grow, but I feel like for some people maybe it's really heavy to have to do the same story for like three years. Right. Yeah. Like, and then, yeah. and then, and then you bore the whole thing and then they're like, this story doesn't work. Let's throw out all the boards and let's redo the story in this other way because it's going to work better. Mm -hmm. So like, I feel like it's a preference. So yeah, I don't feel yeah, like yeah. Talk, you, yeah, I don't I feel like you're talking bad about advertising. You're just expressing a preference. Ah, yeah. So I, I work in advertisement because it's the business here and yeah. it's a way to earn money. Like when I took time off, like <laughs> I still needed to support myself. And if I could like do some freelance stuff here, it was awesome. And then again, I think, I mean, I never um, think of my work in advertisement as storyboard experience, but kind of it is. And you're taught to, like you have a client and you do what he or she wants. And that's good, like to separate yourself from your work and like you're, you pro, you're providing a service and you learn to distance yourself. And now that I work in feature, as you said, like if you're working three years on something that gets uh, scrapped in the end, well, it's hard to not take it personal, but I kind of learned this attitude from the start. So I guess that was kind of a good lesson. And I find this is like something that it's like something I hear from everybody I interviewed so far uh, with Dion uh, from Pixar and from also Esteban said the same thing It's a blue sky. Mm -hmm. And they both said like, you know, like the transition from school to working in animation and in the industry was the hard part was to understand that I'm not making my own film. I'm serving someone else's vision. And how can I, yeah. I can, how can I use my skills and my storytelling taste to enhance their vision? Exactly. So I feel like probably the good thing for you is that because you started working in advertisement first, you did, you did that preparation before going into future. So probably that's good. Yeah, totally. Also before, uh, because I worked in like business administration, it was like, you're always serving someone else. So you have do you, the do you feel do you feel something from that experience in business administration translate in the way you you work with people in animation? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, because you know, as a remote artist and not coming from one of those schools or not having studied animation at all, you still need to kind of you you definitely need to approach all the people like by yourself. You're remote. You have to put out a lot of emails and knock on so many doors and make people. Um, like you have to get the attention of other people and I well I learned how to write emails how to send invoices to make um, uh, how, like just to approach people so that was very helpful how to communicate on a business level and not like a student and, and uh, going back to your experience so you said like one of the things you learned in advertisement was uh, to serve the, the client vision and not take it personal do yeah. you feel there there are other things that you didn't know or didn't expect uh, when you start working in animation that maybe like are good lessons for people who want to do this kind of job? Yeah, let me think about that. So, so I wasn't surprised about the long hours or that you have to work overtime because the interviews I did for my thesis, like everyone was telling, it's such a hard job. Like it's like you, it's very cool, but there's a lot of work. So I was never surprised about that. But well, that's a nice thing, but I was surprised how kind everyone is. I feel like the whole animation industry, every like you're friends with everyone. And before, like with clients, you're like on more on a distance, you're saying sir, and like not the, the first name of a person and it's more distant. And with animation, we're all friends and everyone's helping everyone, at least in my experience. But I made like, yeah, I, I feel but like I, I only made good experiences so far. So I was lucky. I feel like it's also because probably like um, when you work with a client, he's your like he's literally your client. Right. But when you work in animation, you work for your director and he's not technically it's your client sort of. Yeah, he's, he or she is my boss. <laughs> but at the same time, they are more like the captain of your team. Right. Yeah. And that's why there's like a more friend, friendly relationship because the client wants the product while your captain wants you to perform at the best level possible, right? That's a good like comparison. <laughs> yeah, because like, at the end, like the client is the studio, but the people you work for are technically in, people in between you and the client, 
And yeah, that, that's that true. makes it easier. I, I, as I said, like in the previous interview, like the, the best directors to me were like the one who were able to filter the stress coming from the client. Ah, uh, yeah, I heard that. Right? Yeah, uh, and it's the same thing. Like when you when you work directly on advertising with your client, you get all the stress directly mm -hmm. to you, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um. And so, uh, fast forwarding, um, how did you end up at Netflix? I guess. Well, in between, you worked for after a brown bag and all the advertisement in between the jobs. You worked for well, Cinesite, where we met. Yeah. Uh, on an <laughs> unannounced film. Uh, I think it's announced. It's on their website. Anyway, I'm, I'm not say, gonna let's... say. I'm not gonna say. I'm not gonna say. I don't know what's happening with the film. So, okay. Um, and then uh, uh, you had other feature film experience, right? Like yeah, the called Ballet Films. They're a Chinese studio, so uh, I worked with them also remotely and through like the. The acting head of Story kind of was in LA, so I usually talk to her and not with the studio directly. I guess, uh, how did you come about these two jobs maybe? Because I guess like people watch and wants to get into the industry and they're not going through the schools, they're not going through the internship, mm -hmm. they're wondering how do you go from brown bag and advertisement to feature film? Yeah. Um, so what I always did just in general, if like people are interested in my case, because like remote and without the school, what, one huge tip I would give out to everyone is uh, like write emails, knock on all the doors, be very persistent. I know we've talked about that before, but I feel like that was the successful, st uh, stra how do you say that? Like that was Stra strategy. Yeah. That word. Yeah. <laughs> so that's very important. But my and also and also be prepared of a lot of emails not being answered though. Right? Oh yeah, totally. And don't get frustrated by that. It's just normal. <laughs> yeah, like like one of the thing I, I talked to friends with lately is like, uh, and I find like Netflix is doing a very good job in making people understand that is that mm -hmm. you know if if a recruiter is not answering, it's not because they don't want to answer you. Sometimes it's just because the email was like on a pile of other emails and they thought to reply later and then they couldn't have they didn't have time. The new emails came in or they had like a meeting and there's so many things going on behind the scenes that. You never really know why they didn't answer, so yeah. like don't don't take it personal. I exactly. Guess, Keep up the faith in yourself. <laughs> which is something you always told me when we discussed this topic. Yeah, but still, you know, I also like <laughs> I'm the same. Like, why don't they answer? But I know in the back of my mind, it's okay. Like they probably saw it, and you never know. Just being optimistic. Personal um, story, like I tell you, like. Because you, you, you told me about that and I was like, what do you do when people don't answer you? Because I was really like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know if I should email them because some recruiter tells you like, if I don't answer, just email me again. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I don't know, is that like, should I wait three months? Should I wait two months? I don't know what the process is, right? Like, I feel like I don't want to be bothering people. But what happened to me is like, I, I, I emailed with a recruiter for, um, for a while, like years back. And then at some mm -hmm. point I stopped emailing this person because I was like, well, there's nothing there. Maybe like, maybe I'm not a good fit for the studio. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then she actually emailed me like two weeks ago. Really? Oh, cool. Yeah, Congratulations. Asking, asking, asking me if I, well, just asked to, if I, if I was available to send the portfolio because they were recruiting. And so they were like looking at portfolio. If I was interested just to send a portfolio. Um, yeah. But, but again, you know, like I thought like this person would never, uh, email me again but you know that's not the case so you never know anyway yeah it's like you never know you just have to be persistent um yeah but going back to your questions how i found my jobs yeah. like the first one was through facebook kind of because i knew the director and cinecide where we worked together was because of cinzia mm -hmm. cinzia angelini who's very very kind and very generous and she was kind of director head of story yeah, of that she's, she's, she's now directing uh, at Cinecide. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. so cool. And how we met was on Twitter. <laughs> it's so random. And we connected there and I think we wrote a bit together. And then she approached me and asked like, if I want to join this production. I mean, yeah. that was without her. I mean, I'm so grateful. Yeah. It's just S because of her. Same here. I owe, <laughs> I owe a lot to Cinzia. Yeah, she's, she's very, very nice. Yeah. And kind. 
And uh, then with Gold Valley Films, it was because I did a mentorship program through Women in Animation and Natalie Nuriga, um, she was my mentor. And I think she recommended me to this studio or the, the head of story in LA. So I got approached by them again, very lucky. And Netflix, do you want to know the whole story or? Yeah, yeah tell me the whole story of Netflix. Well, I it's guess not Netflix. a very long story. It's, yeah. it's like what we have already talked about, about writing emails. So I guess maybe a year ago or even before, maybe spring last year, I, I wrote to them and introduced myself, made up the email addresses, looked on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a good place, by the way, if you want to find recruiters. <laughs> Explain what you, what you mean by making up an email address, because maybe some, some people don't know. Okay, so you normally those studios are not very original, so you have like <laughs> email. <laughs> the email body is usually at animationstudio.com. I yeah. know other people do that too, so I'm not the only. Yeah, one. yeah, no, no, no. Like, well, I, I, did, I did that too. It's actually one of the tips someone told me. It's like really. Yeah, well, they were, they were. I was like, I was like, I think I talked to someone at Lightbox or CTN, and they were like, oh, like we should keep in touch, whatever, whatever. But then we didn't exchange emails, and I was talking to someone. I was like, you know, like this person told me to keep in touch, but actually, I didn't ask the email. She didn't give me the email. And she's like, uh, um, and this person was like, um, you know, like you can always just put, you know, first name, dot last name or. Exactly. Like that thing, yeah. So. That's the anyway, truth. <laughs> anyway, so like you, you contact people, you contact people, uh, recruiters on Netflix, right? Exactly. So I think at this time, I don't remember, maybe you know, but I think any, uh, Netflix animation was kind of starting out then. Or maybe it has been around for half a year publicly. And I feel like they were, if you approach them, they, they were very open and maybe we're just looking for people in general. So when an opportunity comes up, they know, how, um, they have like a pool of people who they um, can get in touch yeah. with. So I had a talk with one of the recruiters, a very nice lady. And that was, I think maybe around May last year. And then she was like, yeah, in summer we might have staff, so we will get in touch again. And then some came along <laughs> and nobody got in touch with me. So I wrote to them again, I was like asking, hey, I'm around, do you need someone? And they were like, oh, cool stuff you have on your website. Yeah, maybe in fall. <laughs> then fall came around and I wrote again. <laughs> <laughs> it was always the same answer until, yeah, next year. <laughs> and then I was also at the point, to be honest, like, come on, maybe maybe they don't want me. It's okay. And then funny, uh, funnily, like in November, I think they approached me which is always so nice when you get approached. <laughs> um, yeah, and they told me like, we have this feature production and they actually, they, they always told me, we have your portfolio in our tool and we show it to our shows and we will get in touch if someone's interested. But that's such a standard answer. Like everyone says that, don't you think? And then you're yeah. like in your mind, yeah, right. So, but in this case, it, it actually came true. They, someone saw my portfolio there and they got in touch with me and then I had different talks and yeah, like that. Then I started in January. Uh, it's, it's like uh, when I was talking with you on, on previous interview, he told me like that uh, when Netflix approached him, he, they, he, they were like, uh, well, he interned there, of course. So it's a bit different yeah. dynamic, okay. but like, but like they said, two years after he interned, they said, uh, one of our head of stories, so your old portfolio would you be interested to apply, interest in applying? So like they, they really do keep your portfolio on file. And yeah. apparently, apparently they actually do go through them sometime. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's surprising sometimes. <laughs> yeah, as I said before, like we don't, we don't really fully understand what happens behind the scenes. So I guess trust and believe. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> but, but so, um, to sum up a bit your journey, what do you feel were like the main obstacles for someone who didn't go to one of those, you know, schools and that also I like, pretty much work from from Switzerland, from a country where there's not that much animation industry, right? Mm -hmm. what, what were the main obstacles in your opinion? Well, I think the distance, like you, like I said before, already you have to get people's attention. I think it's much easier if you shake the hand of someone that you leave a longer impression. And when you don't have the opportunity to do this, you don't have career days or job fairs or whatever, you have to find ways to still get in touch with people. So I think 
being like confident and don't be scared to like approach anyone. So I think there was maybe an op well, not a real obstacle. I mean, but that was maybe tough. Would you say you're an uh, introvert or an extrovert? I guess I'm more extroverted, I'd say, because I don't have a problem with approaching people. I'm still like I'm nervous and stuff, but I, I'm not sure if people can see it. And I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm I'm All extroverted. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say. Uh, oh, I'm just saying because, like, for example, I know that uh, for I, I, I'm originally an introvert. Ah, okay. Like when I was a kid, and I feel like it's still in me a bit. So like uh, yeah, I, same. Yeah, yeah. I, I, tend, <laughs> I tend to get really into my head, for example, as I said, like when I email recruiters and they don't reply or they tell me like, write me in two weeks and I write and then tell me like, write me in three weeks or stuff like that. I really start thinking like all the behind the scenes of why I'm not getting a job, right? But yeah. did you, do you have that thought process or are you just yeah, like... Totally. <laughs> yeah, totally. So my other main obstacle would probably be self-doubt. It sounds yeah. so wishy-washy but um because like there's no one waiting for you and I don't know how it was in your case but in my like my friends and all the people I'm surrounded by nobody does that nobody works in animation so you really have to be strong-willed and believe in yourself and that you can do it and but for me it, it was a, like the main motivation maybe was like I just wanted to have tried it I don't want to be 40 years old or 50 years old and and always yeah so I thought I'm like I'm still very privileged that I could even try it not, not all people can but I had the luck to kind of work as a freelancer here uh, take this time off and still support myself financially from my own money so I know that's very privileged but yeah but I, I feel like self-doubt is something that is like even even if you have like a community of people who works in animation you still have it because I know yeah. so many people and I was actually uh, reading someone from, uh, I think it was DreamWorks uh, tweeting, like uh, storyboarding and DreamWorks, but like there is like a discussion of someone saying like self-doubt. I have like these, these days, I feel like an imposter syndrome. And someone was like from DreamWorks were like, well, you know, like I have the same thing sometimes. Yeah. So like, it doesn't matter how high you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scale. Also because the higher, the better you are, the higher you get in, in the industry, right? But the mm -hmm. higher are the challenges. So like, like even if you get comfortable with your imposter syndrome, then you do the step up and the syndrome comes back, I think. Yeah. Kind and of. You, you see like new stuff before you're like, you see those other people that are so good and you're like, oh, I'm so bad. I, I need to practice. <laughs> and then you get better. And then you see like the artistry of people above that. Like, oh, damn, they're even better. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, I, I, it, it's also like a good um feeling to have sometimes like it's not nice like you don't you don't live a, a good life if you if you always have this feeling but at the same time i had this experience recently where you know like i i feel like i felt like i was working so much that i wasn't really taking care of my artistic growth so i had to take a step back and look at who i want to be as a story artist so i, I look up like a uh toby shelton or yeah. uh, or even Norman LeMay, all these story artists, they're like amazing. They have like great cinematography mm -hmm. and great drawing. I had to take a step back and be like, okay, I want to be that. And yeah. so I'm That's here, important. they are there. And and so like, because of this imposter syndrome, you, you take a step back and you, hopefully you get the energy to keep improving. Because otherwise, if you feel like you are good enough, then you kind of like stay the same, right? Yeah, you stop, you don't progress anymore. So that that's a good thing. As long as you can see like other people are better, it means you're improving, but you don't have, like it, it can't like tear you, tear you down too much. Then it's yeah. not healthy anymore. Yeah, yeah. Cause it's it, like it, a balance. Yeah, and I, I don't have this balance all the time. Like <laughs> you should either. ask my family <laughs> and they would like paint a, big, a different picture maybe, but. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like, one thing I was talking with, with some friends and they were telling me, like, you know, like some for some people working where I'm working, mm -hmm. it's already like a goal. While yeah. to me, when I'm working is is like it's just like a step and I know where I want to get. So I, I'm yeah. always like sometimes I'm so into my own mind that I want to improve. I want to get to this other studio or this other feature film or directing or whatever it is, the goal yeah. that I'm not realizing that where I am, it's, it's, it's the goal of someone else. Right. So, like, yes. 
Um, That's kind of the mean thing. I just thought about that as well, because when I was like starting out after university, I was like, I just want once in my life worked as a story artist and then you do that and then or you're like a revisionist and then like, no, next goal, next goal. And my goal, I think in the beginning was maybe to work at least on one feature in my lifetime. And now I'm like, no, 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 I want to have more. <laughs> and you, like you said, you always have to look back and see where you already got to and like it's good to be proud of yourself as well to be like yeah you already yeah. reached some goals so yeah because otherwise you're just chasing this new goal all the time and you never appreciate where you are or where yeah. you're being and uh you know it's not healthy if you if you, no, if you, you just will constantly keep... feel bad and that's not yeah. good <laughs> yeah um i'm gonna i have a few questions but i want to skip forward because uh you you talk a lot about putting yourself out there and reach out to people. So I want to kind of go into your Instagram uh, part <laughs> of your career. So like you have almost now close to 10, 100,000 followers. Yeah, it's so crazy. <laughs> uh, and uh, and the thing is like you, you, you put out a comic on Instagram every few days pretty much. Um, I tried to. And, and you've been 